you're all very welcome to the Trot United Supporters Club meeting. I know we're having a bad season, so relax. <laughs> we have a bad. No, you're very, very welcome uh, to Millmount. Uh, my name is Des Grant. I'm the chairperson of Millmount Museum, and I'm also the chairperson of the Old Draw Society. Um, our, the Millmount Museum is 50 years old this year, and uh, is that someone's fault? Great. Uh, it's, uh, so we're doing the museum is celebrating its 50th anniversary, and the Old Royal Society is celebrating its 60th anniversary. And this is our home. Millmount is a very, very special place for us. We're blessed to be here. It's a Loud County Council property, and I have to say, they are a very good landlord to us. Uh, and we do our best. It's a volunteer organisation, as you're probably all aware. The museum is volunteer run. And, uh, and over the last 50 years, we've progressed it, and we continue to progress it. And we are very, despite difficulties, we're very optimistic for the future. So if you're not a member of the Old Royal Society, I ask you to join us, because it's the Old Royal Society that actually owns the museum. And I thought about tonight's speech and what we, we might say to you, and I was saying, if you ascend from Drawda from the south side of the Boyne to the viewing platform up here at Millmount, I said, it presents, uh, it presents quite a striking scene of the town. <coughs> I said, this is an old town from the late 1100s, uh, a medieval town, a town with a rich and proud history, an extremely proud history. They used to say the people of Drawda had golden hands and they could make anything, and that's true. You know, in the 1800s, we were one of the, the, the great towns of the British and Irish Empire, if you could call it that, and we prospered. And part of that prospering is represented in the streets, those beautiful hilly streets of the town, and those the fabulous architecture, and I don't need to tell you about it because you're so familiar with it. It's one of the few towns, it's one of the few places I know outside of London where there is six story Georgian buildings. The buildings at the top of Fair Street are actually six stories high when you go to the re rear of them. Incredible, and you could argue that they're six and a half and possibly seven stories if you want to include attic space and double basements that they have and what have you. To our fabulous banking halls, to the Dutch Billies, you know. And when you think about it, I actually can't think of one town in Ireland that has the, 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 the architectural and the heritage that Drawda has. The only towns that I can think that could put it up to this town is the likes of Shrewsbury, or Chester, Chester, or Bath, or Canterbury, where they have a Barbican gate, which is smaller than our one, but it's nearly identical. It's not quite as prestigious, and where they charge seven euros to climb up it. And beside it, they have a guest house, and the best pub in the town, and a youth hostel, and a tourist office, and what have you. It's, they make something of their gate. So, the buildings in Drawda are starting to rot, they're starting to fall, they're crumbling. They are. Some of them, we've lost a lot of our heritage, but we have been losing it for a while. So, the quaint shop fronts of Drawda are the match of anything that I've ever seen anywhere. Our subterranean basements, you know, and the vaults, you know, and sustaining these buildings it is a complex process, you know. We know that the value of the buildings have dropped by about 80%, so the income from them has dropped 80%, which puts pressure on the landlords. And this isn't a blaming game here. Everyone's under pressure. Everyone's trying their best. There's no baddies. There might be the odd one, but most people are good people, I've found in this world. And no one wants to see their own building crumble and, and, and collapse into rubble. You know, the council has done what they have had to do, the government is doing what they have to do, but the solutions to this are out there, and I think Ireland's going in the right way and we will get them, and there's people like you, uh, there's a lot of representatives here tonight from the council, and from all walks of society, but one thing is for sure, everybody in this room is passionate about Drawda, and they care about this town. So, Drawda is 
in many ways the cradle of <coughs> civilization in in Ireland it was we were the ones that built Newgrange you know they were they were our forefathers that Boeing coracle that's over in Millmount Museum is the third most important exhibit if any exhibit in any museum in Ireland after the Tara brooch number one which was found just outside Rhoda and brought into uh, the West Street and number two, the Book of Kells. And number three, the Boeing Coracle. <coughs> Why is the Boeing Coracle the third most important in Ireland? It's because it's the only exhibit in any museum in Ireland that links us back to the prehistoric people that lived in New Grange or anywhere in Ireland 5,000 years ago. The National Museum wanted it. We wouldn't give it to them. So they actually manufactured a replica. <laughs> so that's it. And it's not for, we're not, we won't be handed over at this stage. Anyway, the, the gentleman I want to talk to you tonight uh, he's uh, a campaigner, uh, he's been a remarkable voice for the people of this town. He runs uh, a social media site called uh, Derelict Drogheda, which has a huge following. He has been, at times, a, a sole and a lone campaigner for our heritage and what needs to be done. And I want to welcome him, and I'd like you all to welcome them with, firstly, if you don't mind in advance, a round of applause, and when we finished, a round of applause. Don Gradwell. Uh, thanks, Des, for the introduction, and, and thanks, everybody, for turning up tonight. Uh, it's a lovely summer's night. It's the first lovely summer's night we've had, and I can't understand why 60 or 70 people wouldn't prefer to be at home in the garden rather than listening to me. Um, I'd like to thank Des for the introduction and the Old Draw Society for the invitation um, to platform my views or our views, if you like, the Derelict Ireland movement on <coughs> what's happening in Drada um, in terms of our heritage, um, what we're losing, what we're saving, what we're trying to save. And then we'll, we'll, we'll go a little bit further and talk about um, dereliction then. Um, some of you in the room might know me and some of you don't. Um, Don Gradle is my name. Um, Gradwell is a, is a long established Drogheda family and um, we came from England in the 1850s and settled in Drogheda. Uh, we've been here ever since. A um, couple of notable things that happened in my family history. Um, my grandfather John Gradwell was the mayor when Dominic's Bridge was open so the name is on the plaque down there. And my great grandfather um, George Gradwell um, bred the horse Drogheda that won the Grand National in 1898. <laughs> um, I'm passionate about Drogheda. I love Drogheda. I bleed Drogheda. I travel around the country quite a lot and everywhere I go I promote Drogheda in a very positive light. Um, I feel we've got something unique in this town and I think we should cherish that. Um, just in relation to heritage and dereliction, I'm, I'm no expert. I don't claim to be an expert in any way. Um, I don't have any qualifications in the subject in building or anything like that. Um, I, I'm not a quantity surveyor and I make no financial gain from anything that I do in terms of my, my um, work in relation to dereliction. Um, I, I don't claim to have all the answers. In fact, I don't even know the questions. We're starting this journey now. Um, I, I also want to dispel the view, and I get it, I get kicked back a lot that what I'm doing is negative because um, um, some people say that when I call out the decline of built her heritage it portrays our city and I'm going to call it a city in a bad light but I think if people actually read between the headlines and between the read behind the lines they'll see that we're, they're missing the point completely. <coughs> I think what we've got to do in order to fix the problem is first of all identify that we've got a problem. And when we've identified that we've got a problem, then we can start looking at solutions. Um, <coughs> like everybody in the room, you know, we all have a dog in this fight. We all want to see our town not alone retain its character, but we want to see our town thrive. And part of that thriving town centre revolves around businesses and buildings. And if the buildings are occupied and in good condition, that means you've got a thriving business community, a thriving arts community, a thriving sports community. And what I'd really love to see is people living back in the town centre as well. And if you've got people living, sorry, city centre, if you've got people living in the city centre, you've got life in the city. <coughs> and you travel anywhere across Europe, what you'll see is you've got vibrant city centres. The European norm is what we should be going for rather than the American stuff where we're 
ribbon development or sorry donut development we're developing outside town centres we should be developing the core of our cities as Des pointed out we have something very unique in Drogheda and I think we should celebrate that um, just kind of run you through just a kind of a brief overview of what I'm going to cover in the in my presentation slide presentation so um, the first kind of section is about heritage so I'm going to be looking at the heritage that we've lost that Des talked on, touched on as well um, I'm going to be looking at the heritage that's at risk and it's a very topical subject at the moment with what's going on in Narrow West Street and Brady's in particular. And I'm going to be looking at what was saved and what can be done. And then I'm going to, going to be moving on to dereliction. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the Derelict Sites Act. Um, I'm going to just do a bit of a tour of the town just to let people, uh, just to give people an idea of what the first impression would be if you're arriving at the Drada. It's going to be a very visual thing. Um, I'm then going to focus on Loud County Council and their role in what I see as the dereliction issue and problem in Drogheda. Um, we're going to look at the reasons for dereliction and how it progresses. And then we're going to look at, look at the, uh, the effects and the impact of dereliction. Also going to look at the issue of property rights, which comes up quite regularly as well. And then we're going to look at the solutions. How do we go about so solving the issue and what we as individuals and collectively can do in order to bring this to an end. Okay, so I'll kick off. Um, iconic building. Um, just want to give some credit to photographers. I'm going to be using some photographs here tonight. I haven't taken them all. Um, the previous photograph there was taken by Anthony Murphy. Um, this was taken by uh, Tony Campbell. So I'm going to, it's, just, it's an overview of uh, dereliction and threat to heritage in the draw of 2024. A look at the causes, effects and possible solutions to the crisis. And it is a crisis. We are at crisis point in Drawder now. Um, particularly with what's going on in Brady's what's potentially going to happen in other buildings around the town. This is a crisis and it needs to be dealt with as a crisis. Why did Eric draw the action group? I, you know, I don't, as I say, I don't have a skin in the game except I am of Drada. That's the skin I have in the game. Um, I'm hugely concerned at the, the alarming levels of decay and dereliction that just have been allowed to take hold over the last, la last two decades in particular. I'm frustrated and at the neglect and lack of concern from property owners and the local authority and its effect that it has on the community as a whole. Um, th there was a resignation that dereliction had become normalised. People just accepted it as if, yeah, it's okay, it's dereliction, what the hell, you know, that's, that's just the way things are. And I started looking up instead of looking straight ahead. And I think a lot of people during COVID in particular would have done that because everywhere was quieter. Uh, people had more time. So as you walk across the town, if you weren't hit by a falling brick, you could look up, you could see that dereliction was beginning to take hold. Um, and I started sharing my thoughts on social media and it's become, it's become a, a bit of a monster. Um, I'm kind of part of a, a greater movement, which is a loose conglomerate of people all over the country. And on Twitter, it's the Derelict Ireland, the hashtag Derelict Ireland movement, um, set up four years ago um, by Frank O'Connor and Jude Cherry in Cork. People who had come back from living in Holland and started noticing dereliction in Cork. And Having been down there with them on Monday of this week, um, they have a major problem in Cork as well. Um, as I say, I travel a lot around the country and I see dereliction everywhere. Drogheda's pretty bad. Narrow West Street's probably the worst street in Drogheda. Okay. So, in terms of saving, protecting and restoring our built heritage, our future is up to us. It's up to us. We have power. As individuals, we have power. Collectively, we have more power. And we have to speak up to try to retain what we have left. We're losing heritage at a rate of knots in this town and we need to, to speak up. This is choice A. If we don't speak up and call out the inappropriate owners, this is what happens. Fires happen, roofs are taken off, buildings decay, and we have Brady situation happen all, all over. Or we can choose this route. This is being done, this is in West Street. It's actually been done up at the moment. Um, it's due to open pretty soon. It's a join to the old permanent TSB uh, building. Look at the architecture in that. That's what we have. That's what we have to retain. And that's what we all have to fight for. And there are individuals out there who are fighting for this and are working hard towards this, but we've got to fight harder. <coughs> in terms of what we've lost, um, I call it the South Core. Um, we are our own worst enemies. There are other people are doing this to themselves. The South Core is if you like the bottom of the hill here it's the bull ring it's john street it's james street it's graves lane just ripped 
ripped apart, a whole medieval streetscape, a whole history. If you've read Walter Mack and Seek the Fair Land, the first chapter is based in that area. We've lost that. We did. Draw the people, knocked that in the mid 70s, put tarmac over it to build a bypass that was since bypassed again. How ridiculous is that? And then the old grammar school. Um, most of us are old enough to remember that being desecrated. <coughs> again, by drawing the people. And I happened to bear witness to that actually happening because I was a young man when it happened. And I was on my way home from a nightclub in the back of a taxi as, as the diggers were knocking that building. And it was around this time of year because it was almost bright. It was about half four in the morning. I saw that happen. What else have we lost? It's kind of topical. That's what Brady's used to look like. <coughs> Brady's doesn't even look like that today. It looks like that today. The top floor is gone. That didn't happen overnight. That's been happening for years and it's been allowed to happen for years. The building's at risk. We can all see them. Dunning's Mill, fire in 2019, I believe. That's five years ago. Absolutely nothing has happened since, except it's changed ownership. Brannigan Weavers, probably used during the FLA, I'd imagine. Um, but since then, in five years, the roof has mysteriously disappeared off Brannigan Weavers. There's no roof on that building. So that building is obviously at risk. These are, this is heritage. I mean, that's, that's a 19th century mill. <coughs> this is a warehouse. Warehouses that all over the country are celebrated and faded and used by the community for whatever reason. Yet here, it's just a pawn in the game. <coughs> Again, people my age, very familiar with that building on the left, McPhail's. McPhail's was, was a, the hub of our youth. That's where we went. Every, I couldn't say every night of the week. Every <laughs> night of the week, it was busy. I wasn't there every night of the week, but it was busy. <laughs> it's shameful. It's shameful and embarrassing to look at my fails in that state, man. Shameful and embarrassing. And then, I'm not gonna to concentrate too much on Narrow West Street. Everybody knows, everybody knows what Narrow West Street is. Everybody knows the state of the buildings there. Everybody knows kind of what's going on. That's the, the former Carrington building. I remember going in there with my granny and going downstairs and it was an, an incredible place, run by incredible people, <coughs> a fabulous cafe. Um, part of that building is to be the oldest building in, in Drogheda, the oldest standing structure in Drogheda. And it's under threat, under serious threat. And if any of you on social media have seen Anthony Murphy's drone footage of Brady's, you can see the roof of the carton. Again, slate's missing. So that is, that's, it's under serious threat. Some people here might have gone to school in St. Philomena's. Yeah. yeah, lots of people here have gone to St. Philomena's. Fa another fabulous heritage building on Duke Street. So as you're walking across West Street and you walk between what was the old AIB and St. Peter's Church. Look up to your right. That building is a disgrace and has been allowed to fall into disrepair and is definitely at risk. And the last one here is in Palace Street. Again, these two buildings owned by the same guy. Okay, and I'm saying nothing out of court here because he's on the derelict sites register. I think both of them are now. Um, <coughs> but certainly they hadn't been for a long time. Owned by the same guy. <coughs> and it's not just private individuals that let their buildings go into decay. These two buildings are owned by the local, local authority. Low County Council own these two buildings. The one on the left, they've owned for many years. The one on the right, they've recently taken ownership of that from the OPW. But again, that's embarrassing. The OPW, who should be in charge of our heritage, owned this building and let it decay for years and years and years. And now it's passed over to local authority. And we pray that they might do something to retain them. We pray, we don't know. The local authority are spending, and I understand maybe why, they're spending about 12 million on new offices. And this is going on. Back to the OPW. Um, in there somewhere, in there somewhere is the Butter Gate. There's Lawrence Gate. The Butter Gate in any other city in Europe would be a major tourist attraction. It would be the major pedestrian route from the bus station where people come into the city yeah. up to here, yeah. Oh, yeah. where people could come up and enjoy whatever this place could offer because it could offer so much. This whole millman complex is incredible. And the Buttergate is probably in there somewhere.
covered in weeds, covered in ivy, covered in vegetation, covered in growth, uncared for, or it would appear uncared for. So we should be gaining ownership of these things and turning them into something proper. Lawrence's Gate, people fought long and hard to get Lawrence's Gate closed to traffic. It happened six years ago, roughly six years ago. OPW took ownership, nothing happened since. A few flower pots, no traffic. They were supposed to turn, supposed to develop a plaza around it. Is there anything happening? I don't know. The thing is, buildings may belong to people, but heritage belongs to us all. Ownership comes with the, the social responsibility of custodianship. So ownership is one thing, you can own something, but you've got to care for something. All of us here are only passing through. This heritage has been here for generations, for centuries. And the last 50 or 60 years has seen a huge decline. So we've got to do something to stop. We've got to make sure that the social contract is brought back into play when we're talking about um, heritage buildings. Is there hope? Um, with property in the right hands, with proper legislation, state agency oversight and support, it is possible to stop the rot. It is possible. I'm going to go through a few examples here of really good stuff that's happening in the town. I've got some water. Um, first one isn't so much of a heritage building, but that's the permanent TSB. Um, <coughs> it's been restored lovingly, you can see. I mean, there's a lot of work and a lot of money has gone into that. That's going to be in use fairly soon, and this is good. This building, Urbana, looks like it's there since the 1700s, but that actual building was actually built in 2000. So it's possible with the right planning laws and the right planning mindset that if somebody wants to build something and draw it, it can fit in with its built environment. It can fit in with the architecture of the vernacular around it. That can be done. So they're, they're, two, good, they're two good ones. <coughs> Water for anybody? Two Georgian buildings up in Lawrence Street, um, up at up at Lawrence's Gate, very well restored back in 2000s. And again, back to this one again, it's part of the permanent TSB, but it's a gorgeous building. It's been restored glowingly um, and hopefully open soon. Maybe slightly topical, but the merchant, <coughs> and what's happened to the merchant now is only fleeting. Okay, well, a lot of money was spent on the merchant to bring it back into the state it's in. It was sitting there at the Lawrence Inn for I don't know how many years, falling down, vacant, potentially going derelict, potentially at risk. It was bought, it was done up, a lot of money was spent on it. We might not agree with what's happening there at the moment, but as I say, that's fleeting. The town will benefit from that building for, for generations to come. And this one here, is, it's, it's special to me. That's Paradise Place, it's been done up at the moment. That's where my grandfather was born. So that's a family home, my family home. Um, sorry, former family home. I wish it was my family home now, but it's not. Um, it's, again, it's been lovingly restored. Um, I'm sure with all sort of architectural historians all over, crawling all over, but that's been restored to, to a thing of beauty. Apparently it's going to be done in the next few weeks. Um, so that's the good news. Now the juicy bit. <laughs> dereliction. So, if we define dereliction, the Derelict Sites Act 1990 defends the sign, the, sorry, defines dereliction as a site which detracts or is likely to detract to a material degree from the amenity, character or appearance of the land in the neighbourhood because of structures for it which, which are in a ruinous, derelict or dangerous condition or the neglected, unsightly or objectionable condition of the land or of structures on it or the present deposit or collect, collection of litter, rubbish, debris and waste. It's a fairly broad, fairly broad stroke, okay? Covers, covers a lot, okay? So I'm gonna, it's a little bit of audience participation now for you, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna ask you a question, and you put your hand up, okay? Derelict or not derelict, put your hand up. If you think that's derelict, put your hand up. <laughs> it's not on the Loud County Council derelict sites register. <laughs> audience participation, hold on, more coming. Derelict or not derelict? derelict. Okay, well, that one's, that one's on the radar, that's okay. <laughs> What do you think? Derelict or not derelict? Hands up. Derelict. Derelict. Not on the Low County Council Register. Derelict, not derelict? derelict. Not on the Low County Council Register. Derelict. derelict or not derelict? derelict? Derelict. Owned by Low County Council, not on their own register. Okay, so 
So just the first impressions, if you were coming to draw that for the first time, this is the first impression you're going to get to draw that. I'm going to bring you on a little bit of an orbital tour around the town. Okay, so we're going to the approach roads. So we call it the dereliction route. So if you come in the Boyne Road, you go up Green Hills and come in the Boyne Road, just the top of the core. Um, this property, again, it's not on the derelict sites register for Low County Council, but it was. <laughs> so there's an interesting story in this one. It was in the derelict sites register. Um, Low County Council used to be really, really good at CPOs, and they did lots of CPOs back in the 2000s, whatever, up until <laughs> very recently. They CPO'd that property. Fine, that's okay. Um, the person that they CPO'd it off appealed the decision and got the CPO reversed, pleading with the council to take the CPO away, that they do the property up and live in it. In 2018, six years ago, it's still like that. It's still like that. So that's, that's part of a terrace, a beautiful terrace of, it's probably George, a beautiful terrace of Georgian houses. And that's at the end. And that's causing a lot of problems for the neighbors in the area, I know that much. Uh, I won't say it's owned by the sister of a well-known politician, I won't uh, name any names. Okay. If you come up Green Hills, the old Boyne Mill, plans for a hotel, big headlines in the newspaper, huge investment coming, big hotel coming, nothing happening. Nothing happening. Years, this is years later, nothing happening. So you hear plans, plans, plans. This is what you get. Nothing happens. Terman Fecken Road, again, plans for this one. So you'd hope. I mean, Peter Smith is here, it's up to the blues. I'm sure they love looking at that when they come out after the match. North Road, we've been on this one before, uh, Low County Council, yeah. have refused to call this derelict. They've put a, a dangerous structure notice on the, the building. It's not derelict, as far as they're concerned. Mm -hmm. we, we, need to, we need to work on that. Uh, Mel, we've looked at this one already. So if you come down to the No Road, so if you arrive into Drona by bus, that's what greets you. Again, not in the derelict sites register. Uh, Delete Road, sorry. say again. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's just... I've lived in Drona for 40 years. And that's when shocked. I came, it was open. Yeah, yeah, the start. 40 yeah. years ago, yeah. and it hasn't been open for 20, 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the Baymore Road, again, up by the school. Uh, it was a great shop when I was at school, uh, up in the Baymore Road, while it lasted there. Um, the Marsh Road, I skipped one, the Dublin Road. There's no dereliction on Dublin Road. At least there's no obvious dereliction on Dublin Road. There may be in between the, behind the high walls and the bushes. You know, but you can't see it. But there is, n not that I can see, and there was no dereliction there. There was on the height where Urban Life are building the apartments up on Cromwell's Lane. You could call it Dublin Road. That's no longer derelict. It's been, it's been um, worked on. Again, down the Marsh Road, as you come in, that's what you meet. And even if you sail up the Boyne, <laughs> even if you sail up the Boyne. <laughs> okay. Now, apparently there's news on the Hebel Sand that the Hebel Sand is going to be removed. And what I've broken up and taken away. But well, it's taken years for this to happen years for this to happen and it's not good enough so I'm not even going to go into the town centre I mean that was from 2022 this was when the campaign started I just went through derelict buildings but I'm not covering vacancy here tonight vacancy is a huge problem as well as dereliction vacancy is what leads to dereliction every derelict property at one stage was vacant so this is derelict only so I'm not going to go into the town centre we all know the issues that we're having in the town centre particularly on narrow western <coughs> So next question, is the council working hard enough to protect our built heritage? No. 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 Okay, that's the derelict sites register. If you want a low county council, and it's a clunky enough website, but you will get to that in the planning section. Um, so when the derelict Drawda Action Group started a campaign in 2022, has anybody any idea how many sites in Drawda were on the derelict sites register, low county council derelict sites register? One. 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 Yeah, okay. In 2022, Two short years ago, we had only one officially derelict building. One. Um, there are now 28, okay? So there's 28 listings of derelict properties in Drawda on this list, which is, it's progress. I call that start. It's nowhere near the actual figure. It's nowhere near the true figure. Um, there's 28. The issue with this is, every one of those properties that are on the derelict sites register is, is, can be levied on an annual basis at 7% of the value of the property. So in order to levy the property, you have to value the property. But the problem is, while Low County Council have 28 properties on the list, they've only valued 14 of them. And Low County Council will always say, we've no money, we've no money. 
And there's a source of income for them, a, a relatively easy source of income for them that they're just ignoring. And I know people will say, oh, well, look, you know, the owners won't pay, the owners won't pay the levy. Everybody knows in business what happens is if the levy is there, it's on the balance sheet. It's shown. It's shown as old money because it's a charge that remains on, on the building. It's a charge that remains against the owner when they go to sell that later on. So I, I, I estimate the real figure of there. It's, I say 50 plus, it's probably more. Okay. So I got the feeling that people said that, you know, low county council weren't enough. I did a straw poll on the Derek Trotter Twitter page uh, last Saturday week. And I asked the question, in your opinion, has Loud County Council been doing everything it should be doing to tackle dereliction and vacancy and draw and other parts of the county? I'm amazed that 5% said they weren't. Yeah. Amazed. Now, having said that, I can qualify that because somebody who said yes sent me a message to Twitter and said, oh, I read the question wrong. The question wrong. <laughs> okay, so the figure is probably more 98 as against, or 97 as against 3%. 186 votes. That will tell you. That will tell you. And we have some elected members here tonight bring that information back. This ne information needs to be fed back to the council. They need to understand what people on the ground actually think. They need that fed back to them. And I'm, I'm imploring all of the elected members to make sure that, that this is <laughs> top of the agenda for every meeting. Every meeting that happens, dereliction needs to be top of the agenda. The question needs to be asked, how many properties are on the list? How, many, how much levies have you taken in this year? And have you valued the properties? Are you doing your job? Just asking them to do your job, that's all. I mean, it's their statutory responsibility under the Derelict Sites Act that they maintain an up-to-date register. Up-to-date register means having the number, having the properties listed, but valued as well. As far as I'm concerned, that, that register is, is not, it's not, main, it's not keeping up with statutory obligations because it's not up-to-date. Okay, how does dereliction, dereliction take hold? It always begins with vacancy. Okay, so, you know, why, why does vacancy happen? It happens because of maybe family disputes, no living relatives or probate issues. That's pretty standard. Um, it also happens when people buy investment properties. Just leave it there. Okay, bit of speculation going on maybe. Uh, council apathy and inertia that they don't do anything about it. Um, the Derelict Sites Act, which is a bit clunky, and I'll deal with the Derelict Sites Act a little bit later on. And even though there's a vacant, the vacant sites tax, it's self-declared. So self-declared in Ireland, I'm not so sure, you know, I'm not so sure that was a really good idea. I welcome the fact there's a vacancy, a vacancy tax, I really do welcome that, but I think that it needs to be maybe tightened up a little bit. So how does their election take hold? There's a syndrome called the broken window syndrome. So what happens is, you have a building, broken window. I actually saw one, a building I never really took notice of before, but again, a piece of masonry fell off it during the, week, the weekend. Um, it's the one on the corner of Shop Street and Lamb Street. Mm -hmm. And again, I looked, I, it's the first time I ever kind of looked up because it's, it's an occupied building, it's painted up, it looks well. Um, didn't realise there was issues with the, the structure. But it's a broken window there. There's a broken window in that building. Now it's owned and occupied and it's running as a business downstairs. But it's potentially derelict upstairs and th that's a feature of Drada, dereliction in Drada. That happens quite a bit. You know, the roof states then fall off. You know, roof states, and that can happen. That, that happens. But sometimes the roof states have taken off. And that also happens, and that's a big issue. And um, the guttering then collapses and malaise sets in. Then the vegetation grows, and once the bedelia starts growing in the building, that means your structure is getting damaged. That means you've got to do something to to, to remedy that, or else <coughs> we're going to have issues with masonry falling. Then you've got water ingress, and the water ingress is stuff that, like what happened in in Brady's. I'm pretty sure that's probably the cause of it. If water gets into these buildings, they're at risk. And we looked at the Carlton, the former Carlton building in Lara West Street earlier on. Roof states are missing off that building. There's water going to go in there. It's going to be a problem. So who's to blame? Who do we blame for their election? We can blame everybody. Who's to blame for their election? So there's genuine cases. What I call the genuine cases are the accidental owners. The, the people, the, I mean, there's cases where people are incapacitated or may, may end up in a home and their house is unoccupied. All those things are okay. The family disputes, family disputes will happen. You know, that sometimes takes a year to resolve. A uh, little confession to make. I live in Trinity Gardens, and the house next door to me has been vacant for, well, it was vacant before I bought my house, which was 34 years ago. It's been vacant for 37 years or something, due to family dispute. These things are very, very difficult to sort out, you know, especially if there's intransigence on both sides. And probate can be an issue as well. Who else do we blame for their election? The state agencies. So the local authorities I mentioned, you know, our, our famous local county council earlier on. They own this, they own 
the Westgate House. You know, they own several properties in town. They own the, uh, the former Riley Brothers. So there's vacancy and dereliction there, and they're to blame for that as well. Um, the OPW, who we looked at earlier on, um, with um, um, the, uh, the, the Border Gate and Lawrence Gate. And then the HSE. HSE, not so much in Drawden. Uh, but if you travel around the country, the HSE have lots and lots of empty buildings all around the country. There's one particular big one, huge one in Banlas Lowe that I, I just know quite well. Um, the church. The church owned property in Drawden. That's vacant, unused. Some of it's derelict, some of it isn't. But it's, it's owned by the church. The church, who are supposed to look after their flock, own vacant buildings in a housing crisis. <coughs> And then in red, I put in the investor and the speculator. And to my mind, they're the main culprits in the product centre. It's evidence-based and it's public available material. That is our, it, uh, it is members of our own business community who are doing this to us. They're doing this to us. Draw the people using draw the built heritage as a plaything. It's like a monopoly game to them. And it's time we call it. We need to call these people out. It's time to put a stop to it. We have to do that. Dave McWilliams, you know, the, he's the well-known commentator, uh, the economist, writes <coughs> in the Irish Times every week, has a podcast. He calls them inappropriate owners. He calls them social vandals, and he calls them delinquents. I'd have a few ch more choice words than that, but that's what they are. You know, dereliction is social vandalism, and it affects us all. And these guys need to be called out. They have no concept of custodianship or any degree of social solidarity at all. All they're interested in is the money. And the buildings may belong to people, but the heritage, I keep on saying this, the heritage belongs to us all. So people talk then about property rights. And property rights are protected in, in, uh, in the Constitution, which is fair, you know, absolutely fair. So the property rights in Article 43 say the state acknowledges that man, in virtue of his rational being, has the natural right to the private ownership of external goods and guarantees to pass no law attempting to abolish it the right of private ownership or the right to transfer. And I get that thrown at me quite a bit. It's my property, I do what I want. It's my property, I'll do what I want with you. I don't care about you. Nobody will tell me what to do with my property. Constitution will though. Because subsection two states that the state recognizes, however, that the exercise of the rights mentioned in the foregoing provisions of this article ought in a civil society to be regulated by the principles of social justice. And may as the occasion requires delimit by law, the exercise of said rights with a view to reconciling the exercise of the exigencies of the common good. Social justice and the common good. And if, you, if your property is affecting the common good or is having a negative impact on social justice, that's where the Constitution has a go at you. So, on the one hand, it gives you the right to property, but it also gives you the responsibility to maintain the property. And a lot of people forget about subsection 2 while they go on about subsection 1. So we need to make the wasteful use of land and property an expensive pastime. That's the bottom line here. That's how it, that's how it stops. Behind that, the image behind there is the Abbey Circle. I'm not old enough to remember the Abbey Ballroom, and I'm not old enough to remember Bogues Timber Yard behind. But I've seen photographs. I've, I've seen bo photographs of Bogues Timber Yard, and that was an incredible building. That was flattened for car parking. And uh, the old Abbey Ballroom apparently was a gorgeous building as well. Don't remember it. It was replaced by this in the 1970s, I think. And that was a fantastic facility for the town in its day. I don't know how many units were in it, but I remember that place being thriving and full. You know, all sorts, I mean, with all sorts of shops in it. That was an incredible place back in the day. And they played pool upstairs as well if you were bow going on Mitchell School. <laughs> so the societal impact of dereliction. So what are, you know, what, what, what are the causes? What's, what's the effects of dereliction? So it's lots of business. So if you've got derelict and vacant properties downtown, it means you don't have a shop. It means you don't have activity. It means you don't have interaction. Lots of heritage. We've seen this week, we've actually lost a bit of heritage this week. I'm praying, I'm praying that that heritage will be rebuilt and I'm praying it's not gonna take decades for us to see that. But we're losing the heritage and we've gotta stop that. Difficulty in attracting new investment. And again, people say that to me, oh, you're portraying draw it in a bad light. If a few tweets portray draw it in a bad light, how would a prospective investor feel if you drive from down Narrow West Street? You know, which has the more negative effect? Do you think a few tweets has? Or do you think the driving down in a, 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 a street that, and I keep on saying this, looks like Sarajevo in 1995. You know, it's that bad. It looks like a war, a war zone. The hollowing out of town centres, and again, planning has an issue with that as well. 
So what's actually happened is the town centre has moved away and the shopping's moved out to the uh, outer core. So we've got to reinvent our town centres. Um, it's an unfair burden on fellow ratepayers. You know, if every, if, if every owner of a vacant property, their property, was forced to do them up and forced to put them into use, that means the rates could come down for the rest of the people, honest people who are trying to trade and make an honest living. And that benefits everybody. Believe me, it benefits everybody. It's a breakdown of social contract. And it's also, I mean, this, this is like, it's the only use of buildings in an accommodation crisis. We actually have an accommodation crisis here. And there are buildings going to waste that could be used to accommodate people. Families. People who are on homeless people, you know, young families trying to start off, could be starting off in these properties, but they're just unable to. So the big question, how do we solve the issue? Like a bit of Beckett, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail badly, keep on going, keep going. So, um, one of the key things is it, it increased central government for local authorities. Local authority funding has been decimated in the last kind of 50 years or so. So we've got to get, get, local, get money back into local authorities so they can invest in sorting out the issues. And then we can force them to carry out the statutory obligations under the Act. You know, they, they can start really policing dereliction if they get more money. Now, I, all, I always maintain that they don't need external money to do that because if they were policing dereliction correctly in the first place, as I pointed out with the derelict sites register, they'd be generating enough in, in revenue to resource teams, dereliction task forces within the councils. The, the role at the Living Cities initiative, and this is a very important one as well, Drona is a population, urban population of 45,000, catchment population 67,000 people, yet we're not included in the government's Living Cities initiative. <coughs> That's an absolute shambles. That was a political stroke that was taken back in whatever, you know, 2000 and whatever. Um, Kilkenny, ironically enough, was included in that. And Kilkenny is about two thirds the size of Drogheda. And you can see the impact of stuff like the Living Cities initiative. Because the Living Cities means that people who own buildings have a financial support to enable them to be able to build, to be able to do their buildings up. It's quite telling, actually, I was talking to somebody during the week about um, a business downtown um, in West Street who were looking to develop their upper floors. And the council, which is their right, they said, look, you've got to comply with this planning issue and you've got to comply with that planning and that fire regulations and all that kind of stuff, which all costs money. And the people who want to do up and provide <coughs> seven units of accommodation just don't, can't afford to do it. So it's going to sit there idle. But if we had the Living Cities initiative, it would give them some financial assistance and maybe that would be the thing that would enable them to actually go ahead and do what they need to do. So we've got to work hard. There's a general election coming fairly shortly. So we've got to work hard and push to make sure that when candidates come to the door, their election to the agenda, stuff like the living cities has to be on the agenda. Um, this might go down too well with the lefties, but I think tax breaks for investment on to bring buildings back into use. Des will back me up on this, and that's probably a good idea. I mean, you know, something like the Section 23s or whatever from years ago, but really well policed, really well managed. If you've got the proper tax breaks in place, and proper management of those tax breaks, you're going to get the right type of buildings in the right type of places, owned by, hopefully, the right type of people, owned by custodians rather than delinquents. Um, we need a common sense approach to building and fire regulations as well. So a building that was built in 1750 or 1820 is not going to be the same in terms of, as, a, as a building that was built in 1980 or 1920. So we've got to be a little bit more sensible in how we, we adapt the planning laws and the fire regs to suit existing building stock. Otherwise, we're never going to bring it back into use. And we've got to fight tooth and nail, and I keep on saying this, and I know I'm speaking to the various ethnic bodies, fight tooth and nail for the re-establishment of our own local authority for the catchment. Yeah. We've got to do that. Yeah. So whether that's a city, or whether that's a, a standalone local authority, it isn't called a city, but it's, it, the key thing is that we manage our own affairs. We have got to take back control of our own affairs. You know, interestingly enough, you know, what's going on at Fair Street at the moment is a beautiful new council building. <laughs> to my knowledge, there won't be one director of services based in Toronto. So. We're the biggest, biggest city that isn't called a city in the country. And yet we don't have one, one senior management from the people who are ch charged with looking after affairs based here. If they're here, they see the stuff. They see dereliction every day. 
if they're somewhere else 20 miles away they don't see it if you don't see it it doesn't matter it's somewhere else um, I spoke about the, the Derelict Sites Act earlier on. Um, Derelict Sites Act is in dire need of an overhaul. It's there since um, 1990. Um, it's <coughs> clunky and not absolutely fit for purpose. Now, there's some good things in it, but a couple of small tweaks would make it an awful lot easier for local authorities to do what they need to do. Um, so, uh, my belief is that the 7% levy should be increased but it should be an increase on an incremental basis. So it should be probably lower in the early years, but once you go, go beyond five or six or seven or eight or nine or 10 years, that should be incrementally going up year by year. So it's more punitive as you go on. So the longer you leave a site vacant, you're, you're punished more effectively. And the introduction of compulsory sales and compulsory rental orders should be part of it as well. Um, the CPO process, it's, it's, it's clunky, it's expensive, um, it's, difficult for councils to do. Lower County Council were very, very good at compulsory reports as orders for years, but it is a clunky and expensive um, process. So if there were things like compulsory sales orders like they have in Scotland, which work very well, it's a very simple process. You have to sell your property, bang, it's gone, that's it. There's no, no long drawn out legal process, no huge legal fees. And the other thing is, if we, we need to task revenue with collecting the levies. So the levies are, allegedly collected by Loud County Council, so they levy the, le levy the property owner. The question is how much of that do they actually collect? How seriously do the property owners take a levy coming from the council? Whereas if an envelope drops in with a harp on it, saying you owe revenue money, you're gonna perk up. It'll soften the cost, okay? So I think that's it. So these are all, you know, kind of ways of dealing with things. And you look and say, oh, yeah, but look, it's a big, big problem, what can I do? What can I do? If you see it, say, I started doing it. Other people have done it. All over the country, people are doing it. See it, say it. Dereliction is now becoming part of national discourse because people are saying it. Report dereliction to local authorities. So there is, again, it's a clunky system, but there is a way on the Low County website, Low County Council website, where you can report a local uh, uh, derelict property. Um, it's, you have to download the form, you have to include your photograph and stuff like that, so it's, it's quite clunky. But if they get inundated with reports, that's when action happens. Hound the public reps. Hound the public reps. So we've a new council in place, okay? So every time you meet a public rep, mention dereliction. Ask them to bring it up. Make sure they bring it up at every single meeting. That dereliction in Drada is mentioned at every single meeting. Whether that's who's new on the list, when are you coming down again, how much are you collecting, how much did you collect, when are you gonna value the property? These questions have to be asked almost on a daily basis. So when the councillors go for the, their monthly meeting, the, the management on Dundalk, Dundalk know it's coming. And if they know it's coming, they're gonna be aware and they're gonna work harder to make sure that they've got their homework done. Um, we've set up a dereliction and housing task force in Drada. Um, and again, we're gonna be asking some, some of the elected reps to get involved in that. So follow what we do. So we only set it up in the last couple of weeks, so we haven't gone public yet with, with social media and stuff like that. But you know, when we get it set up, we'll be promoting it widely. So watch us, follow us and help us. Because it's, it's in everybody's interest. You know, we're at the forefront, but everybody has a responsibility. Everybody in this room has a responsibility. Shame the speculators. Shame them. That's a word that we don't use too much, you know. Um, I think the only reason there are 28 properties in Drawdown on the Loud County Council, Derry Sites Register, is because they were shamed. It's because they were getting bad publicity. It's because there were tweets going out, because they were mentioned on Facebook, because people were actually seeing what was going on, people were becoming aware. <coughs> they started working on it then. They're not doing half enough, far from it. Um, as I said, the, the election is imminent, so you know, call for an overhaul of the Derelict Sites Act. Again, if anybody needs any information on that, I'd be willing to help. I, again, I'm not an expert, but you know, there's, if there's enough people asking for the same thing, we have a really good chance that the act might be, might be reviewed. And get involved in community activism. If somebody said to me five years ago, I was going to be standing up here tonight talking to a crowd, uh, by, you know, by the, at the invitation of the Old Rotter Society about dereliction, I would have laughed. Literally would have laughed. But when I started getting involved, it's become a monster. And it's something that I'm, I have great passion for. But it's something that you know, I can show my love of the town by what I do publicly. So don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to be active. Don't be afraid to be vocal. Let your thoughts be known.
and then say, ah, but who will listen? So you say, look, what kind of results have you got? Well, as I said, Loud County Council have been shamed as beginning to take the issue seriously. So they've actually started to do stuff in dereliction. They didn't for years, but they are doing it now. They're not doing enough, far from it. So we keep shaming them until they do do enough. Um, the vacant sites levy was introduced by, of all people, Fianna Gael. Now, if somebody said to me seven or eight years ago that Pascal Donoghue was going to introduce a vacant sites <laughs> levy, I would have laughed. Pascal Donoghue was completely against any sort of vacant sites levy. And it's just that upswell of activism, that groundswell of knowledge about dereliction and about the issues that are going on and about vacancy and the housing crisis forced his hand. So for Fine Gael to introduce a tax like that is quite amazing. Now, again, it's, it's not perfect, it's self-declared, but again, it's on the statute book so that can be changed quite easily. And grants for derelict and vacant properties introduced by Fianna Fáil, again, that's due to public pressure. Nobody was talking about dereliction five or six years ago. Now it's part of the national discourse. It's huge and drawn at the moment because of the issues that we're having. But I've been on national radio, I've been on, you know, that, I've got lots of national media coverage because people are interested, people want to know. People want to talk about dereliction. And not in a negative way, people want to talk about the solutions. And these solutions are happening, these things are happening. Dereliction is a hot topic. So I, I'd say just keep the, hot, keep the faith. Hope is not optimism, which expects things to turn out well, but something rooted in the conviction that there is good worth fighting for. So we gotta fight, we gotta keep fighting. Thanks, William. Thanks, everybody, for your time. Tom, I want to thank you. That was absolutely outstanding. And if I didn't interrupt, the applause would have went on a lot longer. Uh, we actually, uh, we've recorded tonight's um, lecture and talk because we felt it was worthy of it so it will be released out so anybody who'd like to listen to it again can and anybody who wasn't able to enter tonight because I think we, we turned about 20 or 30 people away unfortunately uh, they too will be able to get it we'll also I have no doubt uh, uh, we'd like to have Don back in, in a year's time for a refresher lecture and, and to tell us what's happened if it, it'd be so, so good to do it uh, listening to the lecture tonight one of the things that, that, that struck me uh, among many things was the, the Duke Street House, what it was called, which is the beautiful Georgian. And during the week, somebody came to me and said, oh, we have a fantastic idea. We're looking for places in Drolla to put yellow heritage circle signs on houses. And maybe you'll come around to town and show us a, a, a few of your choices. And the first one came to mind, well, why don't you do one on, on Duke Street House, which is now derelict? Because that's the house of, of, of uh, John Francis, uh, or, uh, John Michael Nugent. Who's John Michael Nugent? Well, the first national anthem, but, you know, God Save Ireland. And that was when the, he was one of the Manchester martyrs. He was a draw the man. The police came to get him. He jumped out the top floor of it to the north side of the building and came down that way. They say he fell four stories. He didn't quite, even though the report, newspapers report. He made his way to Manchester and escaped, but he was caught and he was one of the Manchester martyrs. At that trial, they were, most of them were condemned to death. And they shouted out, God save Ireland. But the draw the fella, who wasn't condemned, he actually got off. He replied, say we all. And that <laughs> got into the, the, the song, God save Ireland, say we all. So draw the man, and that became our very, very first national anthem. And in the GPO, 1916, when those brave men and women fought for Ireland's freedom, they sang that song every night and roared it out the windows, you know. And I draw the man, <coughs> and that was his family home. And you know what? Let's put the yellow or the blue heritage circle on it as quickly as we can and let everybody know. That's one building. And all of those buildings have a story. I remember one day in the draw the leader when we started out and we were training a young reporter. And he said to me, where do you get the stories? And I said, there's a story in every door. And I said, there's number two, Dominic Street. If you knock that lady's door, she'll give you a story. And to my surprise, he went over and he knocked the door. And he <laughs> said, is there any stories? And she said, yeah, there is. We actually have four number two, Dominic Streets. And the da 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 story went off there. <laughs> so draw this full of stories. Um, 
the story we have tonight by the way a lot of our buildings are in good shape but they are but we are losing them and there, there's a lot of solutions there tonight uh, Dom believes in the carrot and the stick approach and the old road society believes in the exact same thing carrot and stick you know and it needs to be both to make this work um, now we have a little tradition here uh, and we, we ask our speakers if, to, if they take a few questions now do we have another little rule of the old role society if you raise your hands for a question we're, we're looking for a question we're not looking for a speech so you get 30 seconds to give your question and then we talk down so would we like to have a uh, somebody if you'd like to ask some questions yes please so i'd Carl. like to ask if yep. it would be possible there are local reps here would it be possible to introduce the levy to be cumulative in other words, like if you own an apartment and you have to pay management fees, if you don't pay the management fees, that money will be added each year and when the property is sold, that total amount by law has to come out of your money before you get the money for the property, everything you owe. So if you had your carrot and your stick, I think that would be a good stick. I would say leave the 7%, add it up, they'll soon get rid of it if they realise that's going to come out. And if the total sale value then, in the end, is 100% of what is owed, they get nothing. My understanding is that's the way it works. Yeah. Yes, my understanding is that's the way it works. So it's, it's a cube, so it's 7% per annum. But they're not, but they're not collecting it, but, but and the they're not telling them it'll all be taken out of your final well, money. That's the point I made, you know, in yeah. relation to Derek's Lights Register. Um, they don't Sorry, the air tunnel. <laughs> Yeah. They are saying that you go to send it, sell the building. Of course, I mean, I'm telling you. Yes. Oh, yeah, I expect, look, I expect that, you know, the information that goes from the council officially to the owner will, will state exactly what you said. But the problem is they've only started putting the, the properties on the register since 2022. So they've only started levying now. So if they had been doing what they should have been doing 15 or 20 years ago, that would have kicked in a long time ago. Yeah. So unfortunately, they're only doing what they should be doing now, and the, rev the levy is only kicking in now. <coughs> so we're into the second year or third year. But they also have to value their property to make sure you can't levy a property that has no value. So they have to make sure their properties on the, on the register are, are valued. Can I ask okay. one other question? Well, I'll ask the chairman no, now. Well, no, no, you can't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you in the end. Oh, yes, I will, Carmel. Yes, thanks. Dom, I was just wondering, um, obviously you mentioned the big and slight register. Well, it hasn't really been discussed at the derelict site register. Sorry, you're the other way around. Right, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Have you seen the vacant site register? Because I can find it on any loud county council website. Uh, and I think it should be made available to the public because it's the gross uh, figures between the two that mm. gives us our true figure that you discussed. Yeah, you know, yeah. You have a figure there of 50 plus. It's, it's well, well more than that. Actually. Yeah, so yeah. I'll pass this on to somebody <coughs> who knows more than me. As I said at the beginning, I don't have all the answers, I don't even know all the questions, but that's a very good question, I'll pass the field to I was at a presentation this morning below Low County Council, and the Director of Operations said that there's 125... Sorry, sorry, I was at a, a presentation this morning down Low County Council, and the Director of Services said that there was 125 vacant and derelict properties between just on Dock and Drawdown Road. So, and that, that was compiled last year, because we had to make an application to get this rolling seven million fund that comes in, providing the government have got money to address the dereliction and the vacancy in, in the town, in both towns in particular. So if you've got 125 properties and you're getting seven million, not necessarily every year, but you're getting it, say this year, it doesn't go an awful long way towards addressing the issues that we're all talking about here today. But okay. to answer your question, it's 125. Can yeah. this be published? It's certainly not. Put, no. Yeah, well, uh, last of all, can be published and put up on the website, yeah. I think they're required by the government to, to have a, an up-to-date vac vacant sites register yeah. as well. As well as, <coughs> and, you know, they have, have to have a derelict sites officer and a vacant sites officer, that's for sure. Yeah. So they should, of course, have a vacant sites register. Mark? One of the key things you mentioned was shame the owners. Yeah. Can I just say, if, if I owned one of those buildings there and if I went to this meeting, I'd be feeling great right now because cause it, I'm still anonymous. Okay. It's still mm -hmm. not. It's a shame of the owner. Get your question I in. Get your question <laughs> in. You're running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's happening. Is there? A, we have to start naming and shaming because the okay. shame doesn't yeah. work without yeah, the name. Yeah, I mean that's 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 not my job here. Yeah. You know, I certainly okay. am not. 
going to start. I mean, look, some some owners are. It's it's obvious because they're they're excited right here. Um, vacancy is a it's a much more nuanced issue, and I wouldn't even like to. It's a league of mine field. I wouldn't even like to go there. Okay. Next question, please. Happy to uh, share it all a few pints if anybody wants. <laughs> <to play. laughs> Sorry. Guys. Can the county council not get the seven percent levy every year and put it, put it back into the county council to put her into the <coughs> both terms? Yeah, well, the, the point you I made was that you know, if you take her off them every year, yeah, and then increase her every year. Yeah, I I I think the the difficulty is that while it's levied, <coughs> it's it's not really collected, so it remains as a charge on the building. But it's not really collected, so I mean, it, it's it's like a, an entry into a balance sheet. But in terms of hard cash, I actually I, I'd be very surprised if they collected very much last year. And I actually like to ask the elected members if you'd ask them at the next um, county meeting just how much they collected in the last year. But the last, give it the last three or four years. Well, I did ask that question. I gave, I yeah. think I shared the answer, which yeah. it wasn't significant. Yeah, yeah. Now, having mm -hmm. said that, they will turn around and say, as they said to me, that. The collection of the derelict sites levy is difficult. Many owners don't engage with the council, simply ignore the collection notices. The yeah. fines are very, very limited, and yeah. the, the stick as such is yeah. a twig rather than a stick. Yeah, yeah. And that, again, that's that's back to the point I made that I think the derelict sites act needs to be revised. That um, revenue collects the levy. Yeah. You know, rev and and like when revenue yeah, collects yeah. the levy, <laughs> that needs to be ring fenced. Yeah, there needs to be ring fenced of where it's actually collected from. We keep taking questions. Yes, in the back. Are there vacancies going from people to collect the levies? <laughs> 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 Good question. Thanks, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions, please? Yeah. Hi. You yeah. said that the ship or the boat, whatever yeah. it is, yeah. on the on the river, yeah. is going to be dismantled. Yeah. Is that the case? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, in July. When? Yeah. July, I believe. Is that for definite? Because I've heard that. that That's what I've read. You know, so maybe some of the elected members might be, yeah. you know, a bit more yeah. detailed than that. Yeah. Yeah. July. Yeah. July. Yeah. July. Yeah. July. July. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Frank, four yeah. times well, mayor of Drogheda. <laughs> one of the big issues is that people own a lot of property in Drogheda, speculators, and going back the road, 1981. I was outside the grammar school in my robes and protest, and 24 hour protest, uh, read the grammar school and the destruction of the grammar school. And uh, we didn't succeed. And I believe that owner of that property, 50 years on, is the owner of a, pro uh, of a property that we're discussing at the moment. And on Narrow West Street, there are um, property owners owns eight of those properties and the same is in Dundalk. They own quite a lot of property. So you have the speculators coming in. We don't know who half of them are, but we do know some of them. Some of them are faceless. And what <coughs> we've seen is the destruction of Drogheda by these same speculators. So that's why you need to confront these people and they've got off they've got the they got off over the years because nobody challenged them planners didn't chance them, we had no administration in Drogheda, we had no surveyors in Drogheda, we had no uh, overseers to see the properties. And the danger of these properties today is, is of concern to us all, and it's a miracle that nobody has been seriously injured or uh, uh, killed. So uh, I was uh, over there on day one, the day that the, the some of the surveyors were there on the polar day, and the same in Shop Street the other day. I was the first down there when that masonry came off, uh, the bathhouse, which goes back to 1750. And I want to commend you on your um, efforts, Don, but we need to march, all we need to march in Drogheda, and less, th th less talk and more action, and the people need to get behind this campaign. But the task force, should I say, yeah. should be Loud County Council. They have to be answerable for what they've turned a blind eye on one of Ireland's, if not Europe's, most ancient uh, town, city, call it what you want, but at the moment, regarding the city staff, that we've got to put our house in order and we've got to make the owners and speculators responsible. <coughs> sorry, just, that, uh, sorry, just, yeah, just, just, just take away one point there, Frank. I think the business community mm. in Drogheda, yeah. so the council can say what they want, but the business community should be at their peers. Mm. It's members of the business community who are doing this to each other. Right. So part of the business community is, is, is struggling really badly <coughs> because another part of the business community is speculated. Mm -hmm. And they, they should be calling each other out. And they should be confronting each other. And these issues will be maybe dealt with in, in 
in scholars on a Friday evening where all their stuff is just one question, no, Dom. No, Sorry, just one question. No, Frank, I will come back to you. No, no, no. Frank, no, Frank, no, 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 Sorry, Frank, I will come back, I promise. Frank, you got four minutes because you you got four minutes because you were four times mayor. If anyone else is there, yeah. So, you, you're only there for two years, right? So, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, question down there. Yes. Sorry. I put this in the form of a question. Yes. Are you aware that the council tried to buy a number of buildings in Narrow Western? But unfortunately, there are some sort of legal dispute going on. And the judge in the high court. Can't be sold until the dispute is sorted. That's a question. Now you're aware of it. <laughs> and anecdotally, I've heard a few stories. I can't confirm or deny what you've said. Right, okay. Sorry, yes, Anna McKenna, six. City status. Yeah. Congratulations, Stone, Thanks, um, on your presentation tonight. And I think what you've been doing has been terrific, and it has brought the attention, wrongly, wrong attention to it, but it has brought attention to it. To everybody but I think our basic need and our basic failure is the fact that we haven't got our own administration yeah. and when we get our own administration that's when we'll be able to do all this yeah. and your question is Anna and my question is can don't be the first mayor administration <laughs> and governance. I'm working hard for the last yeah. 14 years and I thank you for referring to Drogheda as a city yeah. Yeah. and I would like that other councillors and everybody would start because that's what happened in Waterford it claimed Waterford to be a city, and then it was recognised. Thanks, Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Anna. Uh, before I take another question, I'll take one from Councillor Peel Smith a, in a moment. Um, and by the way, I, I want to say something about the councillors. I think we actually possibly have. I've been covering council meetings in Drawler since I was a cub reporter 30 years ago. I truly believe that this is the best set of councillors that you've ever elected. You know, if you go through them and take a close look, you, you would agree. <coughs> Um, with some wonderful characters in the past and brilliant people but this is a very good set and I think they will deliver for you uh, so well done on that front this is a book called Streets and Lanes of Drawda it's a masterpiece beautiful hardback it covers inside it covers, some of you will have seen it before it's a little story a little bit of historical fact on every single, I think there's about 600 in it every street, every laneway in Drawda Jim wrote this. He was a member of the Old Road Society, a very prominent member of the Old Road Society. Jim wrote this in 1996. Uh, this day, we printed it again. And we decided that we would do it in the hardback, in the green, and with the gold foil. Damn the cost. Because <laughs> this book inspired me as I was a young man. I bought this as my original book from back all those years ago. And it inspired me and made me love this town. It was one of the things that sparked it uh, in me. Um, and so when we bring it out, we'll please buy a copy and encourage other people to do it as well. And it's easy to knock people. I rang, I rang one person and asked them for a financial donation with the help of, the, of this book. It was Joan Martin, county manager. And she instantly said, yes I will and she says I'll put up half the money to print it she says get it out there so I want to acknowledge her for what she did because she always doesn't always get the great press that that sometimes she deserves and sometimes she doesn't but on this occasion she did help us you know so uh, let's take some more questions please yes yeah, I just want to ask um, Pio. Pio you mentioned um, the seven million um, for the town um, is that seven million from the European Thrive Fund, which is 120 million, which was given to Ireland in February this year? And the Thrive Fund is specifically for the restoration of heritage buildings. Are we talking about a separate seven million? Because what the Minister O'Donnell said was each each town would get seven million for restoration of heritage buildings. For example, the likes of Donaghy's Mill could be done as a heritage. Is it, are we talking about two separate? Yeah, basically yes, because the seven million is a rolling fund that's provided by the government for the county, not just for Drada. So it's to take in the whole county. And uh, the tri-funding 
we did succeed in getting 200,000 euros under the trade funding. So I put forward three buildings and draw that for, for that. One was the Taunton one was uh, Dominic's uh, church, church, excuse me, <coughs> and the other one was Westgate House, as we seen there earlier on. So the idea of getting 200,000 for that <coughs> is to develop a, a, a pipeline structure so that when uh, the project is actually finished, it's actually ready to go, show ready to go, and then the government then can come in with the second phase of trial funding, which is between 1 million and 7 million. Sorry. Uh, Peter, you had a question yourself. Uh, yeah, just a quick there. question. In, yeah. You know, the town centre, we all love the town, there's no doubt about it, and all the councils here really put a hell of an effort in, uh, down through the years in my experience. So, the town centre, there's a number of buildings there that are protected structures, and to, to actually carry out work in a protected structure is very difficult and very costly, number one, and number two, to change the actual footprint and the building fabric is very onerous on potential investors and people who, who own them. Yeah. Is there yeah. an argument to be made to look at maybe reconfiguring <coughs> how we look at the town centre in terms of whether or not we should delist some of the structures and look at the footprint and see can we make it more attractive for investors to come in and do some work because we're all arguing to bring in life into the town centre yeah. and now Councillor Callan and, mm. and uh, Councillor Hall and, yeah. and Councillor McQuillan out there and it's all are actually working on the local area plan yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is the first time there's ever a joint local area plan for Drawley. And this is a question yeah. that's going to come up, so yeah. I'd like to know what, you, what your view is. I fully agree with that. I fully agree with that. And I, I mean, part of what I said it was a was common sense approach. And that sounds to me like a common sense approach. Like I mentioned the issue with the, the planning issue with the, with the, with the, the business that, <coughs> that wanted to build a seven apartment. <coughs> Something like that would just change everything overnight. Yeah. Yeah. And I know it's possible to do this building. And maybe, maybe we're a little bit precious about the full building. The facade is the really important bit. That's the, the yeah. bit that you can see. So yeah. I think yeah. the retention yeah. of facades yeah. is yeah. really important. Yeah. What goes on behind is maybe less so. Yeah. Yeah, so I agree with you. Yeah. 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 Sorry. I'm going to come back to you, Carmel. Yeah. 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 So I just want to ask a question. If anything could be done, I see a lovely young man here. And hopefully, Des, when you got that book, this young man is here tonight and he might get some inspiration. But can the council or the authorities connect up with the schools? Mm -hmm. I taught in a very disadvantaged area of Dublin for 30 years, and the kids had no money to do a project for civics or for senior psychogeography. But you could do <coughs> with the council, and there's a problem with insurance in bringing kids out and liability and so on. But for example, when I started doing this in Dublin, in a disadvantaged area, that they did not understand that chewing gum and cigarette butts were litter. So I think you could start by doing a count on West Street of how many chewing gum stains are down on the granite pavement that cost a fortune. Thank you very much. And then an evaluation of how yeah. that with, it, with math class and yeah. geography class and civics class <coughs> for yeah. the junior cert exam project. Now, can I ask Three. you, is, is, there's no question, no, no. The question is, can mm. the, yeah. Yeah. the no, town no, no. council yeah. connect with the schools and cover the liability for the children to yeah. give them the pride? If we've no pride, okay. you have no respect, That's no right. respect, <coughs> you, you anti-social yeah. behaviour. If one of the public representatives will answer that, uh, we, we, we will come back to it. I don't think that they'll answer it here and now. I think that that's a wider question. Sorry. Uh, it's not so there it is. Sorry. Well, oh, I sorry, Michelle. Go, please yeah, take yeah, the floor. I'm a school teacher in a Dutch school yeah. in Drogheda. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in the playground today. Uh, we went across West Street. I gave them a history tour. We quite often I give them history tours to instill pride. We have children from diverse backgrounds that come as well. Um, who don't know the names of streets. The Irish kids don't know the names yeah. of streets either, like in fairness. So again, that's something that we do. I would love to see, you know, I know you want on the agenda mm. every time dereliction, but our debt schools in Drogheda in the last, mm. from 2016 to 2021, we have gone from areas in Drogheda that are minus 27 on the deprivation, social deprivation line up to minus 33. So up in the Mullen area, Finian's Park, Moneymore area, those children are living in severe deprivation. Mm -hmm. So they are, they're living in areas where there's fear and intimidation. 
and huge poverty. I would love to see us talk about that as yes. well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just, sorry, I just feel very strong about that. And just to answer the question on the city status, um, so this is the latest communication that we have from central government. Um, it remains, sorry, I don't have my reading glasses on. It remains the case that the question of city status for Drogheda is not under consideration at the moment. As indicated previously, the National Planning Framework, the NPF, published in 2018, sets out a vision and strat strategy for the spatial development of Ireland in 2040. The framework recognises the strategic importance of Drogheda and aims to support its development and economic potential as part of the Dublin Belfast corridor, in particular the core Drogheda and Dog Canary network. Drogheda's role is reflected at a regional level in the RSES for Eastern and Midland Regional Assembly area. This targets significant growth into the regional growth centres, including Drogheda, to enable them to act as regional drivers. In 2021, both Meath and Loud County Council adopted the development plans which further underline the importance of Drogheda as a key urban centre. It just goes on then to say um, that Drogheda is creation of a Drogheda city. The local authority would have a major impact on County Loud, leaving the County Council with much reduced territorial jurisdiction population <laughs> and sorry, resources. Sorry, that's pure waffle. This, yeah. this sorry, is, pure so this waffle. is from yeah. Minister, uh, yeah. I'll tell you in a minute now which minister. Okay. This would be further complicated by the fact that the area being proposed for Drogheda to qualify as a city includes part of County Loud. For a city council to be established, provision would have to be made for this and okay. relevant le legislation and there's none and that's from the Minister for Housing, Local Government and Heritage. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, I won't even... 23rd of April this year. Yeah, I'm not going to shoot the match, I know, I, I, I know about that, I'm familiar with that, it's just mm -hmm. pure water. That's yeah. just yeah. good. Yeah. That's all it is, I mean that's just clap clap from, so from uh, a minister that really doesn't care. You know, they all say they care about drugs, they don't care, but they, that's, that's pure crap talk. That's rubbish. And we should be fighting against that. That's just that's civil servants speak for like would you ever, you know, no I'm not gonna say. Hmm. You know, it's just yeah. what? Do, do we have any more questions please from this side of the room? Yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Uh, like to, I would like to ask the council yeah. what did you think? They're talking about shops closing the fall and then all the rest. The shops closing in West Street because number one, we can't get parking. People can't get parking in them. Because all the car park spaces are taken away. Now I counted to one of the councillors there some months ago, and we counted over a hundred car park spaces that was gone in Drogheda. There's a lot more gone since then. And what is the council doing about it? And the second one was the state of our roads in our city, in our <coughs> town, in our <coughs> footpaths, in our driveway, or our footpaths and roads. They're down my own area, I live in Newfield, and the road down to Newfield, there's okay. weeds that height yeah. Yeah. On, on the road, and the footpath yeah. is lost to that much but that, with the grass. Can you just frame there. your question again for us? Sorry? What was your question? My question was for the council. Yes. For the council doing anything to prevent more shops closing in West Street. Well, Dom, are you aware of the council do? Sorry, you can ask Dom. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> back that one away, please. Yeah. 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 Back that one away. Okay. We don't, we don't, yeah. sorry, Daniel, we don't, we don't, I don't have an answer here from the floor here unless somebody no, wants I'm to take it. I'm asking the council to stand here. Will they do anything? We spent yeah. a lot of money in the top of Peter Street. Mm. I think. With this gentleman in front of us. Okay. And they're talking about all the properties that are done up. Why was the money spent on that? And okay. what is it for? Yeah. To answer your question then, right, in regards to the, pr the, the money that was spent at the top of Peter Street, that came from the Peace Plus Action Fund. It's a cross border fund. Mm. And that, uh, what it turned into wasn't what it, uh, it was initially designed for. So what happened back in 2013, some of you might remember, Grania Shafri came to draw that and she developed the heritage plan for the town. And one of the flat, uh, <coughs> plans for that town, our town, was to turn Peter's Place into an area where people could actually go sit down and admire the landscape of the town. So look down uh, along, say, Peter Street and look up at here where we are today. Uh, that, that went through a whole process. And then there was a new design concept yeah. brought in, which wasn't a grand design. That was taken out of the hands of councillors and given uh, to a new design team. And the money that came for that could not have been spent anywhere else because it was ring-fenced for that specific project, and it came from the other. Oh, thank you very much. Why did you build a wall as a... Oh, uh, 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 we get on top of it. Sorry, folks, sorry. Sorry, can I just... Folks, we came to...
talk to the yes. 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 Can we just yes. stick, stick to the topic, please? Yes. I don't have the answers to some of the questions I've been asked here. Uh, all right, the old order society. So, uh, yeah. we have one. Uh, so, is it a quick question at the back? Yes, and it's a question for Dom. Yeah, right, Dom, um, you've done a very good presentation. I'm very impressed. I don't 100 percent agree with everything, but that's what. what <coughs> that's okay. That's okay. Uh, we can discuss that privately. Yeah. But what I would say is, what would you like to see next? Because a lot of new people in here are using yeah. this to probably lower numbers in this coming meetings. Okay. What would you personally like to see next? And there's people in this room to be able to help you yeah. get things moving. I didn't hear a huge amount, so don't, and don't take that as a criticism, mm. yeah. but I would like to see you personally say, this is what we should do next time. Yeah, well, part, part of the whole thing about the task force we've set up, like it's, it's, a, it's a, a multi-stakeholder task force, and that's part of what we're doing, is we're going to be coming up with a vision. But like the first week, the inaugural meeting last Wednesday week, and the street we talked about was Narrow West Street, so to come up with a vision for that. I can't say publicly what's happening behind the scenes, but we've some very exciting news in terms of what the task force has managed to achieve so far. Um, in terms of, you know, in, in terms of vision and an idea about how things can look. Um, appreciate the elected members are here, and I appreciate the, that the Westgate vision plan is happening that side of town. That's going to really improve the public realm. But I, I keep on saying that the public realm can be beautiful, but you can't put lipstick on a pig if the buildings are horrible around it. So I think the buildings have to come into public ownership, or at least ownership of a custodian that would make them part of that Westgate vision. So that's, that's kind of one idea, and I'll leave it at that if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Quite yeah. often in the past at these yeah. meetings, um, no councillors would show up. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. would say, oh, where's the councillors? But we have the Deputy Mayor with us, uh, Kevin Callan. We have five uh, elected uh, members. And we have five yeah. elected members. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, would you like to say a few words to us as our... our uh, 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 acting Mayor this year and Deputy Mayor currently placed. Thanks Des and, and Don thank you for yeah. the presentation and mm -hmm. as Des has said Pio's here, Declan Power's here, Paddy McQuillan's here and Michelle's here so yeah. we feel yeah. as strongly as you do about this okay. and everybody in the room and you yeah. can hear the, you can hear the room mm -hmm. agreeing with you as you go. Um, I, in terms of questions what I would say is this, why hasn't Drogheda Borough Council been restored in the last 10 years? That's question one at a national level. Uh, I had a look at the Derelict Sites Act which I had to blow dust off um, for this evening. Why has that never been mm. updated mm. Uh, at national level? Yeah. Um, there's only so much we can do locally with yeah. the tools that we have, and I'm not making excuses. We know an awful lot has to be done. Uh, my question is, um, how can we help you? Maybe okay. you can't answer tonight, yeah. but... Yeah, well, well, you know, I really value the fact that five elected members here. Um, I, you know, <coughs> you're not in the crosshairs, believe me. You know, I understand how things work. I know that you guys make representations on part of the people. You don't have a huge amount of power to make huge changes. Um, you know, th the way you can help is just keep it on the agenda. That's all we can do, is keep it on the agenda. Make sure we're on the front page. Make sure we're forefront of every council meeting that happens. Not just even you know, in, the, in the local area meeting, at the county level, when the chief executive is there, when the full management team is there. They've got to understand that we, that so many people, and you can see the turnout here tonight, mm -hmm. and since it's a beautiful summer's night, the Euro Championships are on, mm -hmm. people have much better things yeah. to be on the website to listen to me over here talking and waffle about their election. So keep it well, at the top of the agenda, and that's what we'll be much of We're going to wrap yeah. it up, Dom, and I want to th uh, thank you for coming, and we'll call for a round of applause, please. <laughs> There's a lot of positive things happening in Drawley. Only a couple of weeks ago you read in the, uh, in the papers of 600 jobs coming to the Lourdes Hospital. Today Hilton Foods put in planning permission for a 20,000 euro extension of their meat factory which will create another 80 jobs in the town. I checked something today. How many houses is Loud County Council going to build in this town in the next two and a half years? 647. That is a ferocious number of houses to build. It's about 200 million <coughs> that will be spent on social houses in this town. This town is on the way up. We are going places and what's happened in our town centre will be reversed and we will get it back. I believe that. But I'd like to leave the closing words and I'll ask Don to make them positive words and, uh, and to close the meeting tonight. Thank you, Don. Yeah, look, I, you know, I believe in our city as well. That's why I'm here. And I believe we've, we've a great future ahead of us. But we just need to get work together. We've got to work together, and together we're stronger. Like Kayla, when it comes 
to make in progress, we've got to be stronger together. And the piece that Michelle read out there from Minister Dower O'Brien, I don't want to hear those words ever again coming yeah. on central government because that's yeah. it's disdainful to the people of Drada, the proud people of Drada, to hear that kind of yeah. clap trap from them. I'm really positive about the future. Des, Des mentioned the increase in population. That alone is going to push us over the line. I think we've got to fight bloody hard to get our own our own management, our own local authority here. And in the meantime, get the Borough Council back in here. We need control. We need to be in control of our own devices. Yeah. So thanks, thanks everybody. Yeah. Any evidence of living left in this time? Would I find any evidence of living?